does not only mean that we do mitzvahs that we were told to do. But actually, it goes much deeper than that. I mean, surely it is through mitzvahs, but the meaning, the union of mitzvahs is that just as on Pesach, Hashem came down himself and took us out of Mitzrayim, which means that Hashem revealed his presence in the world. And it was recognized Hashem's presence in the world. After that, we have the ability to also bring Hashem into the world through our own effort, through our own activity. So one may ask, what does this mean? How do we bring Hashem down here? We are little human beings. And all we have is what we understand. So we do the right thing. And by doing the right thing, we mean we, we are not destroying Hashem's world. We are in conformity with, with, with rules and regulations and so forth. But it still remains a human world. Within the context of a human world, we're doing the right thing. But where is Hashem come into this, that we are bringing Hashem into, into the world? But the real objective is that we should bring Hashem into the world. And somehow, we have that capability. I know it's not a new concept, but I would like to delve into this concept. And I'd like to get together, we should get a, a feel for it and understand what, what it really, what its significance is, what it really means. In today's Parsha, Tazriya Metzoira, it talks about the Metzoira. What is a Metzoira? Metzoira is a, 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 a leprotic person. One has leprosy. And in brief, leprosy is something which represents a very a deep level of tumor, of impurity. And the Torah tells us that this leprosy is <coughs> possible to appear in a person, but the person becomes tome and is to stay outside of the community, a garment that belongs to a human being, and even a house. That's the, the, the house that, that is used by human be by people to live in. It's possible that it should become it should become tome through leprosy. As you're learning, you know your curiosity, I'm sure, will lead you to try and look up in some fortune to whatever extent you have time to see what it means how how. How is it possible and so forth? The Forshim speak about it. But the point which I want to talk about is, <coughs> is something on the side. The Torah tells us that leprosy is a very deep tumor. But that tumor is entirely dependent on the Kohen. A person can have this affliction and he is not Tomei until the Kohen pronounces him Tomei. That's phenomenal. What happened? What is the Kohen? What's, what is the Kohen? The Kohen could be a doctor. He could say, okay, yeah, I identify your sickness. No, it's not that. He actually may affects the tumor. And he affects the Tara when he is cured and becomes cleared, it is a coin who has to then pull him out of the tomb. 
This is throughout the whole Pasha is is constantly mentioned in the Torah. And in one place, the Torah says clearly in the Torah Shabbik Sav in the Psukim it says clearly, talking about the leprosy that appears on the wall of a house, which you haven't gotten to yet in Mitzvah Shem a couple of days. So it says over there that if a person notices some some discoloration on his wall, he should go to the Kohen and tell him there's some kind of discoloration on my wall that appears to be like a mega, like a plague. The Kohen then tells him, go home and remove all articles from this house. Take everything out. <coughs> Why? Because if I come and and I look at it, whatever happens with him, you know, it's if I pronounce it Tome, or even if I have to lock it up, then everything in the house becomes Tome. But as long as the Kohen did not attend to it, did not look at it, then the the the, this, the nega itself doesn't make it Tome. So he tells him, save your articles so that they wouldn't become Tome. <coughs> Take him out. The Torah says, the Torah gives us this practical advice. Which clearly states beyond all misconceptions that it is the Kohen who affects this, this whole thing. The Kohen who, who affects this whole, this whole tomb. We will discuss this briefly, but I want to relate it immediately to the question that we asked before. We see here that a human being, a Kohen, has the actual power <coughs> to affect Tuma and affect Ar. This is in line with the concept that a Yid can bring godliness into the world. He with his actions or with his words. To understand this from our perspective so that we with our background will now be able to kind of contrast this concept with the way we look at the world and see how the Torah looks at the world. Which is always important because this gives us a clear view of the Torah. And it also allows us to, to break away and to know where we're going. <clears throat> In our concept, a person lives in the world and he can only accept the phenomenon in the world. Alpit Torah, for instance, a keli, a vessel, can become Tomei. But a vessel can become Tomei only after a person used it. If it was just made and it's and it's not been in use, then it's not happening to it. It's it's just a piece of pottery or a piece of wood. <clears throat> the usage that a person uses it that makes it of a human of a, um, makes it related to the human being, and that's when it becomes a cave. How do we see the, uh, see from our worldly perspective? The exact opposite. The keili is a keili, and the human being comes and uses it. Not that he, by his use, makes it into a keili. It's there the way it is. And he is only using that which, is, which already exists. If we would contrast these two views of the world, <clears throat> 
we would see the following. <clears throat> On the one hand, the, the, the view that the world presents, itself, presents to us is there is a whole world. Nothing to do with us at all. It just exists. And we come there and we are kind of strangers there. And we are bound by, by its rules and by its, by its laws, by its natural laws. And uh, we, we can use it to the extent that it's beneficial uh, to us. But essentially the world is an entity all completely unto itself. Seeing it from that perspective and seeing it this way, it is extremely difficult to conceptualize godly presence in the world because all we see really is world. And when we see a pair of feeling, <clears throat> we say, oh, this is a holy article. So what do you mean it's a holy article? It's a piece of parchment. And the parchment pre-existed it being film. You took parchment and you, and you wrote something on it. How has it become a holy article? <clears throat> the other view, the Toyota view, is that <clears throat> the world is not just a, a blurb of existence. The world was created and was created by God. And the purpose and the essence of his creation, everything in the world was created for the human being. He is the king. He is the purpose for which everything was created. And therefore, the value of everything depends on the human being. That which the human being attributes value to has value. That which the human being does not attribute value to does not have value. It does not exist outside of the realm of the human realm. We discussed this principle <coughs> several times in the past. And one time we, we discussed at great length the principle of, of food, making a brocha on food. I'm sure you all remember. And make a brocha on an apple. What's the significance of making a brocha? You say, Hashem creates the apple. Hashem, the, the apple is right here in front of me. And it grew on a tree. So what do you mean Hashem creates the apple? You say Hashem cre created the tree that creates an apple. Thank you, God. But where does it have to do, what does it have to do with the immediate consumption of this apple? The apple was now picked from the tree, and the tree is many years old. So we explained <coughs> that when the apple is on the tree, it's not an apple at all. It's part of the tree. What makes into an apple? Apple means it's a fruit. It's made to give a, a person sustenance. What makes it into an apple? It is God's declaration that this apple belongs to the human being. I've made it for you. If not for that, it's not an apple. It's just a, another piece of grass in the part of the tree. What makes it really a fruit is the fact that God has declared it as being created for the person. That's why that's why we say boy eats, Hashem creates a fruit. Now, when I make the bracha, that's when it becomes a fruit. Before I make the bracha, it's not even a fruit. It's just I don't know some kind of a of an entity that we picked from the ground. <clears throat> we 
the <clears throat> the concept that a person with his actions can actually affect the world follows from this quite directly and quite simply. But before I conclude that, I want to go back a little bit to the concept of Pesach. I started from Pesach. <clears throat> Pesach is called Zman Cheiru Seilu, the time when we were granted freedom. Cheirus. So simply we say, what is this freedom? We're no longer slaves to, to the Mitzvah. But of course, the, the Egyptians are extinct now for 4,000 years. So what does it mean, Zman Khir Hussein? You could say, I commemorate some episode, but Zman Khir Hussein means it is an ongoing thing. It is a time of our freedom. <clears throat> and then there is a more direct question, a kind of what's called a klotzkash, mother klotzkasha, in your face, a kasha that kind of stares you in the face. Um, Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim and say, says, you're going to be free from the Egyptians, you're not going to be slaves to the Egyptians. Instead, you're going to be free. And what does that freedom mean? and free the slaves and let them roam around the world? No. I'm going to give you a Torah, and you're going to serve me. So if you're serving Hashem, you are not free. Right? Slaves to Hashem. I'm sorry? Slaves to Hashem. Slaves to Hashem. As a matter of fact, the Torah declares even, Avodahim, they're my slaves. Okay. Hashem took us out of, it's an exchange, but from Pare to Hashem, it may be a pretty good exchange, but still, why are you called freedom? Freedom from all slavery in general, I mean, from... Uh, That's right. And every day in our life, right? That's yeah, but Hashem, but, but, but now, you know, <clears throat> are you free to do what you want? Come Shabbos, you are restricted in the most uh, in strict way? Spiritually free. It's different. Well, it's, it's true, of course. I mean, we are, we are spiritually free, we are physically free, free. But what I'm pointing out is we need to, I want to pinpoint, what does it mean freedom? What is the definition of freedom? Why is this really true and absolute freedom? Not just uh, conceptually, because spiritually too, you know, um, we are told what we, what the truth is. We are told what we have to we have to think, what we have to learn. I mean, what, what is it, what is the concept of freedom? It's important that we understand the whole concept of freedom, because uh, freedom is such a misused word in today's world that. Um, you know, uh, people concoct ideas and say, well, I'm free to think the way I want. Doesn't have to make sense. I agree with you that it doesn't make any sense, but this is the way I want to think. That's freedom. There are arguments today about euthanasia. You know what euthanasia is, God forbid. Mercy killing. Somebody is very, you know, somebody wants to die. So the doctor prescribes to him uh, a medicine and, and he is. Uh, so he said, well, it's my life. I'm free to do what I want. I mean, what, what is, the, there has to be a clear definition of the word freedom. And then when you come to saying, saying this is Malchai Ruseinu, we understand, yes, indeed, indeed this is Malchai Ruseinu. Ah. 
ترحمهم So let's understand first of all that Hashem created many creatures in the world. He created animals, he created the human beings. And among human beings and all kinds of human beings and all the way up to the Jewish people. These are all different creatures. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole world of creation. Each one has a nefesh. The animal has a nefesh. The human being has a nishon. Ayid has a nishon. The nishona and lahavdal in an animal also a nefesh has an inherent desire, an inherent want. An, an animal wants to graze in the field. That's its natural thing. It wants to graze in the field. That's its nefesh. As a matter of fact, you know that animals, we're not allowed to work with our animals on Shabbos. Right? Everybody knows that our animals are not allowed to do work on Shabbos. An animal that's owned by, by a, a yid. You're not allowed to put to put any um, work on it, and yet we are, we we should allow our animals to graze and cut grass from the ground. Why the animals doing work? Because we're not allowed to cut grass on Shabbos. The answer is that for the animal, that's naya. That's that that's that gives it its 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 rest. If it cannot cut grass, it doesn't have a naya, it doesn't have a, a rest. A human being is not allowed to grass cut grass on shops. What does this show us? That <coughs> freedom means when, a, when an, an entity in the world, when one is able to act according, perfectly according to his nishana, according to what he truly is. That's freedom. When one is restricted from acting the way he is, an animal is not is restricted, not allowed to to graze, and its natural tendency is to graze. Then he is restricted from being what he is. There's a din in the Torah that when you're threshing threshing produce, wheat, and you use an ox, an animal, to thresh, <coughs> you will have to allow the ox to eat from the wheat that it is threshing. Because it's a natural thing that it wants, when it has food in front of it, it wants to eat it. And when you, when you muzzle it, you know what muzzling is? When you put a chosem on the, on, the, on the mouth, you're giving it pain. So that when it can act according to its nefesh, that's its freedom. A human being, its nefesh is a ba'ayidin, is a nefesh or a is a godly nefesh. That is the human, the, the essence of the human being. So what does chayrus mean? Chayrus means even though we are in the physical world which is in stark contrast to godliness, right? The, the, the world and godliness, the world conceals godliness. <clears throat> and yet, Hashem has freed us from this restriction. He has elevated us above that, and He said, you are free. What does that mean? You can act entirely according to the way your neshama wants. You are free, and, and your relationship to Hashem is what is what guides your life, and you don't have to recognize the messiahs of the world at all. You're not subservient to the world. You're subservient only to God, and, and that is your essence. That is really the essence, what, what, what the Neshama wants. 
So freedom does not mean <coughs> free to destroy. And freedom means free to express that which is essentially your essence. <coughs> On Pesach, we were made free. Now, over Pesach, surely you heard matzah is called in the Zoyar Michle Dimahem Nusa, the food of Amuna, the food of faith, is the food that strengthens our faith. It strengthens the faith of Eid. What does it mean it strengthens the faith? Michle Dimahem Nusa. On Pesach, we go, we eliminate completely every every uh, chometz, every aspect of chometz. What is chometz and matzah? So there are many things I'm sure that you that you've heard, but in in simple terms, matzah is the wheat in its in its um, unadulterated, unchanged state. This is the way it comes. Chomets is when it was allowed to ferment and things have happened to it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure you, you know, you heard that Pesach, for instance, every home makes their own food, does not bring in processed food from outside. Right? Even if it's 100% kosher, you don't bring in food that was made outside, that was processed outside. Not all, but you know, to what extent, some more, some less. What is the concept of not bringing in processed food? It's not because you're suspecting that it's hummus. It's 100%, 100% not hummus. The Indian that it's processed means that you bring in something that is not fundamental. It's not just the way it came from, from the creation. And we don't bring that into the house because because basically relate exclusively to the creation of to God's creation just the way it is created. That's matzah. <coughs> this principle, this matzah, this is symbolic of our emuna, symbolic of our faith. Because emuna is that which I which I need has without any external effect. He doesn't have to learn about it, he doesn't have to figure it out, he doesn't have to prove it. This is, this is what he has inherent in his, in his neshama. This is the truth as he knows it, without any external effects. That's a moon. Now, <clears throat> what happens in our world is that I know the, what I think, but then the whole world is contradicting it. And now I have a problem, right? I know the way I feel, but hey, but I can't be a fool. I see the whole world acts differently. And Pesach is the time when Hashem freed us from that and allowed us to think the way we think. It freed us from, from the effects of the world. Like I mentioned the other day, that when we say Shema Yisroel Hashem Elokim Hashem Echod, we close our eyes. What does that mean, we close our eyes? We close our eyes means that we do not need any external effect on our thinking. We are then between, between with, with ourselves. Close my eyes and think, what do I think myself? What does my neshama tell me? Not what the world tells me, what my neighbor tells me. What does it look like? What do I think to myself, between myself and, and, and God? That's my soul. So that's why I close my eyes. And when I close my eyes, I know only one thing, Hashem Echot. That I know clearly. And when I, when, I, when I know Hashem Echot, when, with my closed eyes, then I, when I open my eyes, I know that all the things that I now see in the world are really coming out from this Echot, from the same Echot. 
from the same one. This is the principle of real freedom. When I can relate to the whole world from a perspective of the way I believe it is. Not because I construed it, because I, you know, willfully designed it, but this is the way my Neshama sees it. That's the real freedom. That's the meaning of Chaims. So this Chairus, this is inherent in our Nisham. In other words, God in this, God is present within us, present in our Nisham. Our knowledge of God is not a learned and experimented in, in, um, in, in knowledge. It is something that we know with closed eyes. I don't have to think twice. Like we spoke many times, that when you wake up in the morning, you don't have to go to class to find out what... You say, Moidani, that's something which is, which comes, which, which is, which, there is, there is no contradiction to Moidani in a, by Eid. He knows instinctively that Hashem is the one who returned the Neshama to him. And that's what he relates to. This gives him, this is the meaning of freedom, of the chayrus that we got in Mitzrayim. I'm got by, by Pesach. Then, after that, begins <coughs> the preparation for Shavuos, where we have to bring this principle and this sense of freedom, we have to bring it into all of our faculties, into every one of our midas of chesed, Guru, Tiferes, all in every one of our faculties and attributes, and ultimately in our in our full daily activity span. <clears throat> Thus. The other view of the world, the third view of the world, as we said before, there is one view of the world that a person, that there is a whole world and a person is just, has to conform to what's going on in the world. That's not freedom. That's slavery to the natural world. The third view of the world and the human being in it is that the human being defines what the world is because the world was created and given to the human being. Like we said, when does the fruit become a fruit? <clears throat> when we make a bracha on it. And that's the fruit we eat. We don't need the fruit that the tree produced. <clears throat> that would mean that we are subservient to the tree. We eat the fruit that Hashem prepared for us. Because <coughs> we only know of Hashem. We don't know of a tree. Hashem Echot. There's only Hashem. <coughs> so if I have to eat, Hashem has to give it to me. I can only eat what Hashem gives me, not what a tree gives me. That's the significance of making a brach. Is here. <clears throat> Therefore, we can now come to to understand how is it that a human being, a yid, with his actions can actually have affect the world.
like we said, he makes a bracha, and when he makes a bracha, then that makes the fruit a fruit. Before that, it was just some, something part of the tree. When he takes parchment and he writes tefillin on it, the parches of tefillin, and he puts them on, then he makes tefillin out of it. It's not, it doesn't, it's no longer the parchment. Why? Why can he do it? Because the parchment was made for him to elevate it and to, you make it into tefillin. So that Ayid, with his actions, actually is in constant partnership with Hashem. Whatever he does, whatever he does, he actually brings Hashem's presence into, into the world in the, through his actions. It says right there in the beginning of the creation, it says, you say it every Shabbos. That's a very Shabbos, we call Malachi, Asher Bora Elikim, Lassus. What does Bora Elikim Lassus mean? Hashem created, what's Lassus? Lassus means to make. That actually, Hashem created the world, He created the the he facilitated for us to make the world our world. Who makes the world into world? We do. By our actions, we make it the way Hashem wanted it. That's why right there in the Torah it says, when Hashem created other Manishim, it says that Hashem said to him, Pru urvu umilu zoris v'chivshua. It should be fruitful and multiply. Fill the world. And Kifshua means conquer it. You have to conquer the world. Because by us, by the human, by a human being conquering the world, he is making the world the way Hashem wanted it to be. He is completing Hashem's work. And this is what we see in today's Parsha that leprosy is nothing until a coin declares it as such. And before that, it's not, nothing happened. So now, I want to translate this into our own daily lives. It is incumbent, it's important that we reflect on this particularly, as I mentioned, all the time, because we have to contrast it with the world that we are used to knowing. And we have to free ourselves from Egypt. We have to come out. Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. Now we have to take ourselves out of the current Mitzrayim. We have to <coughs> bring into our lives the cognizance, the recognition, the hakara that <clears throat> that we are the ones who make the world into what it is. Our actions is what makes it. Not that we are here strangers and we just have to conform to some physical rules, physical laws. One interesting thing, I don't know if you thought about it, but it's interesting. How do we... What is the central mitzvah on Pesach? To eat matzah. Right? Eat matzah, that's central mitzvah. It's a little funny. What does it mean? To eat? I mean, do a mitzvah, or whatever it is. Go do something good. Be creative. Do something. You sit and eat. And many mitzvahs, some special, they say Shabbos. Shabbos is a mitzvah to eat. Yontem is a mitzvah to eat. Yontem is a mitzvah to eat and be, and be besimcha. By me being besimcha, 
What does that do? That's my personal experience. What does that do to the world? What does it mean? I'm the Simcha and I'm doing a mitzvah. And I'm, and I'm bringing God into the world. But with this, with this introduction, you should be able to clearly understand it. Because God has, has actually associated himself with us and he says, your presence, our presence in the world, and our actions are actually representing God's presence in the world. And this is what we, 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 what, what mitzvahs really mean. So that mitzvahs, we said, oh, we are Hashem's slaves, we have, we have restrictions. Mitzvahs are not just plain duties that we have to do, but, but we, are not, we are not involved in them. There is something which we have to do for someone else. Mitzvahs are part of our own existence. Mitzvahs is what is, is, the, is the means through which we associate with our real Nisham, we associate with God and bring God into the world. The fact that we have to battle ourselves and we have to, we have, like you said, this kafia, this hapka, we have to fight with ourselves. Sometimes we want it, sometimes we don't want it. That is because we have, like the Alter Rebbe explains, we have two nefoshes. We have a godly soul, we have a, it's called a human soul, and we have an animal soul. And the animal soul is also very necessary and so forth. But the animal soul doesn't, it doesn't relate to all this, doesn't understand these things. And therefore the animal soul really has to be told what to do. But our true selves and what our true personal orientation, personal understanding of what life is, does not come from the animal soul. It comes from the Gandhi soul. This is what we know when we close our eyes and say Shema Yisrael. And this is, and this is the Pshat that we were granted freedom from Mitzrayim, true freedom. Because we associated with God, therefore we became free from Mitzrayim. Can you say that again? Because we associated with God, that freed us out of Mitzrayim. Like everything that we come in contact with in the physical world, we do not come in contact with it because it exists in the physical world, but because God had presented it to us and presents it to us right now. There is clearly much to work and much to think and many many levels and madrigues that a person can reach in recognizing this and, and, uh, and uh, so to speak, <clears throat> incorporating this into his life, into his thought. But the principle is exactly this. I illustrated this one time in the following manner. If we are driving on the road, and we come to a red light, and you have to stop. We stop because if we don't stop, one or both of things can happen. One is that we can get an accident. The other is that we can get a ticket. <laughs> a ticket. In either of these things, we are not personally interested in this. We don't want to collide with this other guy. We don't want to get a ticket. In other words, we stop because there's something restricting us. Really, as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to know of anything. I just want to go straight. But what can I do? Something is stopping me. Because I'm part of the world. There's a lot of different things which have nothing to do with me at all. 
and therefore, and I have to I have to obey the rules. Otherwise, otherwise, these other forces are going to come and 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 uh, somehow affect me. This is the way we look at the world from a physical perspective. I have to follow the rules because otherwise there is going to be repercussions, and um, I don't want repercussions. When you come from the perspective of of Hashem's world, then we look at it totally differently. <clears throat> These other people who are there driving a cross in my crossroad, these other people are also God's creations. And I want that God's creation should be whole and wholesome. I, in other words, it's not just for, for protection. I want everything in, in, in the world should be, should be whole. I don't want uh, to destroy anything. So when I stop at the red light, it's sort of a proactive, a proactive um, um, attitude. It's not just because I'm forced to, but it, I want to stop so that so that the other people will be safe to go. Because that's also part of my duty, part of my responsibility, part of God's world. And therefore, even when I'm stopping, I have the sense that I am doing what I really want. I'm serving God. I'm not just following external rules. It could be for your own benefit. Why are you stopping? So you don't get ticket or you won't get an accident. That's right. Yeah. Right. So I'm saying. When you're doing it for your own, not to get a ticket, then that means like this. That this means that you are not really relating to the real essence of, of freedom the way we're describing it. Because it means that there are other forces that are going to do to you something that you don't want, that you don't want to get involved with. But we want to... I'm, See, I'm going to the extreme to explain why is this, what is Cheirutz? Zman Cheirutz saying. The deepest union of Cheirutz of freedom is when a person can act according to the purest and deepest sense of truth that he perceives. That's what freedom is. So here we have like this. When you close your eyes, I perceive that there's only one God. I open my eyes and I see a whole big world. So that contradicts my, this pure perception that I have. <coughs> and what is my duty, my job now, is to continue to view the world from the perception of truth as I perceived it when with the closed eyes and recognize that this which I see over here is all part of that same unit. Not now, now I'm in a totally different world. It's the same world. So if not for the Tzies Misraim, if not for the fact that God took us out of Misraim, then we would not, there would be no, no possibility of doing that. But because God took us out of Misraim, we have that ability. Now, to incorporate the, the, our real perception, our real truth into our daily lives, into everything that we do. So that the, the, the view of Hashem Echot permeates and goes with us throughout the day and illuminates our every, every step in life. So that we do not fall down to the 
to the world and say, ah, oh, like you said, I better not, st- I better, you know, I, I don't want to get a ticket. That means that I'm afraid of something that has nothing to do with my truth. Right? It's a force that comes from elsewhere. <coughs> but by, by, by taking, coming out of Mitzrayim and giving us a Torah, everything that is good, everything that is positive, comes directly from Hashem. And therefore, Ayyid can be serving Hashem all the time. When he goes to sleep, when he gets up, when he eats, when he works, when he dabbles and learns, all the time. And that's the freedom that we were provided by Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Even with Stephen Gallows. I'm sorry? Even with Stephen Gallows. Even though we are still in Gallows. That's right. Even though we are still in Gallows. That's what the Rebbe... <coughs> I declared this was a declaration actually made by the Rebbe Rashab yet. He said, let all the nations in the world know that Hashem, our God, sent us into Golos, but He sent into Golos only our bodies. Our souls were not sent into Golos. And no one in the world has any right or power to enslave our souls. And that's what the whole avoid is about. So when we get up in the morning, and our goof says, oh, I want to sleep more. And then we say, no, but I have to get up. So, from a worldly perspective, we may think, huh, really what I would like to do is sleep more. But I'm forced by one thing or another to get up. Comes the Shukhanara, comes the Torah and says, just the opposite is true. Really, mitzad, the neshama, mitzad, your own self, the real freedom. You want to get up. You want to jump up and, and do your thing. Except because you're in dollars, because your goof is pulling you down. So he is not letting you do what you want to do. So you can force your way out and, and do it. It is important, the, um, see, always shooting for the Nakuda. It is important for us to realize that when we wage war with ourselves, when we fight ourselves, <coughs> we are actually bringing out and exposing our true selves rather than fighting against ourselves. Again, again? Please. When we are fighting with ourselves, like forcing ourselves to do one thing or another, we're not working against ourselves. We are bringing out our true selves. Very, very important to understand. Yes. Back to the, the coin that you said that, you know, as we all know, it, it, what you said, that whenever he comes to <coughs> make a decision, well, the guy has a tarat, then he becomes a then it becomes the, the nega. I'm sorry, the coin, yeah. When the coin comes. Right. Mm-hmm. Come. Okay, so now a Jew, he can have it on the skin. All right, now he's full of uh, tarat. He can walk on the street, people can see him. The guy is full of tarat. He said, this guy is, is a thief. The coin didn't see him yet. But that thing is sick, first of all. The thing is still have on his body the disease. What you call that in the meantime, and tell the coin, when he found that maybe the coin left town, he didn't come here, something. 
you know, on those days, what he has now, what is it? He has a physical sickness, but not a spiritual sickness. He doesn't have tumor. <clears throat> what he has? What people can call him? He's got... Uh, he, had a, he, had a, he has a skin disorder. Not tumor. Tumor is a different thing. It's going to look the same, though. Yeah, it's going to look the same, exactly. So people think, oh, he's got Sarah, he's, he's speaking the Shonara. Before him and the Kohen is going to come. Listen, what people are going to think, if the, if, if the Kohen has come, then he would not be able, it would not be amongst the people, he would be out of, out of the community. Because the Matsuri has to be sent out of the, of the, he cannot be amongst people. But um, yes, he can have a disease, but a physical disease. Physical disease and the spiritual disease are not in the same level. It's easier to cure a physical disease than a spiritual disease. Okay, so now, um, another thing, uh, you said we bring in up everything just like the apple is not apple and tail. I'm sorry? Yeah. Apple is not an apple and tail. That's right. Until we die, until we say so. That's right. Okay. Everything that's created actually, everything that's created, or whatever it is, you can call it, it's until we are uh, Jewish, they clear what it is. That's right, exactly. So, the Rebbe is the Melech HaMashiach, is the king, until we decide, or even without us, is still the Rebbe Melech HaMashiach, or by calling him, by saying Yechia Melech, Every day, that's what makes him uh, what he is. Right. Well, um, the <coughs> Melech in general, there are two types of Melochim. The Ramam speaks about the two types of Melochim. There is a Melech that was made a Melech because people have, have accepted him as a ruler. So he is a melech only because of the fact that he has that position. Then there is a melech, the malchus based David. Malchus based David, the Ramam says, are melochim inherently, from birth. They have that quality of malchus. <coughs> so then, since they are melochim from birth, so where do the people come in? The people then, de by declaring, they're revealing his malchus. But he's the king. Yeah, that's that's what Malchus is talking about. David Amel was the king only in, uh, five years, and, and therefore only on that city until the only king came and asked him. Yeah, but he, but David, right? But when David, when but after that, Hashem made the covenant to David that Malchus is his forever. So then, it is inherently there. They are born kings. Therefore, it doesn't matter if we say or we don't say. That's right. That, 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 that's not going to change it. What's going to change it that is that when we, what we do can reveal it and make it, make it happen to Paul. Give him more power. Right. Um, <clears throat> that's not the case for the rest of creation as well. That an apple is truly inherently an apple because that's how Hashem created it. He created it. By the, with the name Apple, and this is an Apple, and then only by, by a Jew saying this is an Apple and making a brook on it, so then he reveals that this is really an Apple, not that, that he... Doesn't it seem like that's more... I mean, you just say that it's not an Apple until the Jew says it's an Apple, so then what did Hashem create the Apple for? Well, obviously, obviously, um, Jew can only reveal that it's an Apple. They reveal the godly purpose of the Apple. But prior to that, this godly purpose of it being an apple is not there. Because it's just a part of the tree. Malchus based David is different in that. Because um, it's like this. 
the apple, if an apple is not being used as an apple, what happens? It rots away and nothing happened. It never became really, it never came to fulfill its purpose. When it, when it, a human being uses it, then it, then it came to fulfill its purpose. But Malchut Beis David has its purpose inherently. It isn't that when people need him, that's when he becomes a Melech. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, there is there's a Sikha from Rebbe, where the Rebbe says that David is there all the time. In other words, we always have a king. We don't necessarily know him. You know, we don't necessarily physically relate to him, but we always have a king. Since David Amelech, we always have a king. We're not a nation without a king. We can know him, relate to him, or not know him. A nation without a king is like sheep without a, 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 a shepherd. I don't know if I made clear my point. My point is that we have to be besimcha. We have to know that we are into our own element. Even if we are struggling with ourselves, we are in our own element. We are really bringing out our real true self. We are not just fighting against ourselves. It's so important to understand. There's a story of Reb Mendel Futterfass. Time is late, but I don't see anybody pushing around. Um, Reb Mendel Futterfass. You heard of Mendel Futterfass. Everybody heard of Mendel Futterfass. He was in this, in this in camp, in a prison camp. Reb Mendel Futterfass went to Mikve every day. So one way or another, he made his way to, to get into the water. It was very dangerous from various, from various um, angles, particularly because he was under supervision all the time. He was not allowed to leave camp. And if he would leave camp without permission, he can be very severely punished. So one time, the Mendel snuck out of camp. He went to the... To the nearby river, dipped himself in the water. When he came out of the water, his clothes were stolen. Clothes in Russia was a big treasure. It could be torn shoes and, and, and um, patched uh, pants, but many of these, they, these are clothes. And he was left without clothes, just the way he came out of the water. So what can he do? I mean, he can't stay over there. He has to go back to camp because the sooner they're going to start looking for him, it's going to be very dangerous. So he walks and he was a little dejected. <laughs> What's going to happen to me now? He's walking without clothes to the camp. And as he was walking, he was thinking to himself, how low have I gotten to? There's nothing low in that. I'm in prison. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't have any freedom. I can't do my thing. And now I'm completely without anything. I mean, how low can a human being get? And as he's thinking about this, he started thinking. But the truth is that it's like a, a cycle, right? It's like a pendulum. When you go to the very bottom, that's when, that's when things have to start coming up. And as he was reflecting that this must be the time that things will be coming up for him now, the more he reflected on it, the more he really began to appreciate it, and he became joyous, and he started t thinking to himself. By the time he got to camp, he ran into camp dancing and singing. 
because he felt overjoyed because of his belief that this is it. Now he's coming out. When he came, his prison mates told him that, it, that, that the office was looking for him. They were looking for him. So he quickly done whatever goes again. He went to the office. They received his freedom papers. Got clothes? What? Got a new clothes? Got new clothes, yeah. Yes, by the time he came to America, he got some clothes. But we changed reality. There, there is, that's right, there's, there's reality going on. Okay, gentlemen. <clears throat>